We want to thank everyone for coming. As Representative Houghton said, we know we're going to have quite a few utility lobbyists. We're happy they're here. We hope they learn something. Uh, we have our utilities in Colorado moving very definitely in the right direction, and we are very grateful for that. Of course, we'd like to accelerate them and get a little, you know, price competition because price competition does great things. Uh, but we will hope to have a really good discussion. And for some of you that have been around for a long time, you might be kind of wondering about the difference between empower our future, which is what this first slide talks about, and Chris will tell you more about that, and clean energy action, where you've seen me a lot over the years. These two groups are kind of like twin stars or something. Uh, they, we rotate around each other. We do a lot of work together. We have turned clean energy action over to an amazing set of young people. And you will see that on March 31st, clean energy action will be the primary host You'll get to meet a lot of our new amazing young board members. They work in solar and utility, they're utility analysts and all sorts of other things. And we will give a sneak peek on Excel's uh, resource plan and you'll get to see more of them there. But without further ado, I'd like to ask Chris Hoffman to give us, uh, give us the warm up band approach here. Chris, why are we here? Why do we care about choice? What's, what's our story? And uh, Thank you, Chris. Chris Hoffman from Empower Our Future. Okay, so uh, we're just looking back over the history here of, um, this is particularly germane to people who are customers of Excel, that we've seen uh, since 2003 to 2020, the kilowatt hours sold have remained relatively flat and the profit adjusted for inflation remained relatively flat, but the, um, the profit, the after-tax profit uh, is just skyrocketed. Let me just emphasize that the, the gray line is the 2003 profit adjusted for inflation. So if uh, the profit would have been in line with the, um, with the kilowatt hours sold, but instead the, the actual profit has, has skyrocketed. Okay. It's on time. So um, we, we know that there is a great potential for getting a lot more renewable electricity and saving money. This is from a, a request for indicative pricing that Boulder did in late 2018. And you can see highlighted with the red arrow that the uh, average cost of the power supply, not the whole utility bill, but the power supply portion, which is a huge chunk of the utility bill, uh, we could get, um, Boulder could get uh, that for a little over $83 million and the buying it from Excel would be about $40 million more per year. So we could save about $40 million per year just in the power costs. Uh, next slide. Oops, there you go. And, and that, that previous number was with uh, the day one high renewables. If we got to 100% renewable electricity, um, we would be paying um, 93 million. And again, that's much lower than the cost of the Excel power supply, but the Excel power supply is only 53% renewables. So we get 100% at uh, some $30 million per year less than getting 53% renewables. So it's quite a difference. Uh, next slide. So I guess I'd like to uh, hand this over now to Representative Hooten and just first say how grateful we are as a community to have you represent us and how much we appreciate your leadership in this area as well as the other areas that you just mentioned and probably many more that we don't know about. We're just really grateful and we really appreciate you having, having you being willing to be with us tonight. Thank you very much. Well, and thank you, Chris. Um, it is, it's an honor to represent Boulder. Um, it's a very uh, well-informed progressive community. Um, I've been involved with energy issues since I was employed uh, by a US Senator in Alaska in the late seventies when the Alaska pipeline was under construction. And um, so I'm familiar with energy issues and, uh, and then I worked for the Philadelphia Electric Company for five years 
from um, 1988 to uh, um, 2003 or, or 1993, apologies. Um, and while I was working for a Philadelphia Electric Company, uh, Pennsylvania completely deregulated. And that was quite impactful on the state. And I think it has been very problematic because it was full deregulation like Texas. And we saw what's recently happened in Texas, but energy issues concern me very much. I've always been uh, a strong proponent of municipalization. It's a nonprofit. Uh, it gives uh, communities um, independence to choose their power supply, uh, to uh, initiate energy programs, including broadband. Uh, there's, there's just so much you can do uh, as a muni uh, that is, you don't have an option uh, for as a community if you're served by independent owned uh, investor utility. So uh, I'm not, this is not about Excel being bad. It's about options for communities and Boulder has uh, some very ambitious renewable energy goals and they honestly don't have any way to meet them um, because they are dependent on our incumbent utilities goals. And of course, we're not the only community in the state of Colorado um, who is facing that conundrum. So, and this is probably why, um, it is most definitely why the Denver City Council, Golden, Pueblo, uh, San Miguel County, Boulder County um, have all endorsed 100% um, a study. So this, uh, the bill that I'm proposing is just a study bill. It does change nothing. But they're really interested to see how, um, what the PUC study would discover on how community choice energy, which is also known as I think probably everyone on this call knows community choice aggregation, uh, what that could mean for Colorado communities. What the bill does, what community choice energy authorities are, uh, they allow communities or a collection of communities to procure their own energy supply. Uh, the incumbent utility still maintains their infrastructure. They still transmit and distribute their energy. They do all the billing and the demand side management. That's all within, that stays with them. They continue to provide uh, electricity themselves through their own energy sources. So if a community decided to go um, with a community choice energy authority, if they made that decision, uh, the residents of the community would have an option to stay with the, uh, the power provided by their incumbent utility. Um, obviously, Colorado has its resource energy standards uh, any community in Colorado who would choose a CCE uh, would have to meet or exceed those renewable energy standards. We have ambitious 100% renewable energy goals. And um, so communities in Colorado served by IOUs, uh, if they were had the ability to procure their own 100% renewable energy, of course, that would um, lower the, uh, the carbon in our electricity supply in Colorado. I don't know how it wouldn't. Um, the rates would be lowered, maybe not initially, because uh, you would have to pay an exit fee for the uh, resources that the utility did uh, um, procure on behalf of the community before it went to a uh, community choice energy authority. And so that's always factored in, but those are costs that um, have to be paid upfront. 
uh, and the, in my community choice energy study bill, that's one of the things that would be considered in, uh, in the PUC docket is how that exit rate would, what that formula would be and for how long. So I think we can probably go to the next slide. So, so what we're doing, um, I haven't formally introduced the bill. I, I introduced the bill last session. It passed the Energy and Environment Committee and then we had to withdraw it um, due to, you know, we had to make room for COVID related legislation. So I'm bringing it back this year. Um, we've made some changes to the bill. One of the things we've done is uh, we have removed a, um, a, you know, a third party uh, consideration for the bill uh, that brought down the fiscal note. Uh, the, the study would be funded through the fixed utility fund and that is established at the PUC and it's paid by ratepayers. Uh, there's a the very small charge that we that ratepayers pay to uh, the PUC for these types of studies. Um, here we go. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Community Choice Energy, uh, an authority, uh, would purchase. They would source their own uh, electric supply. It would continue to be delivered by the. Um, the incumbent utility and um, the benefits, of course, would be more affordable rates, local control, uh, and cleaner energy. So I think we can we can get there. Yes, and so and this is a great just uh, way to uh, graphically understand how the supply delivery and customer service vary from an investor owned utility to a community choice energy authority and to a muni. So um, I don't think I have to explain it. It, it explains it itself. Uh, really the only difference between an IOU and a CCE is that the CCE procures its own power supply uh, and which is why it's often referred to as muni light. So it's not a full uh, municipal utility uh, but it does have uh, the authority to provide, to purchase its own power and have it delivered by the investor owned utility. So in Colorado, in, in the United States, uh, CCE is authorized in nine states. Uh, legislation has been introduced in a couple others. Um, then you can see clearly Arizona, Connecticut, Hawaii are looking into it. So are Oregon and Washington. Uh, just very recently, um, Ann Arbor, Michigan is, they want, they want a CCE authority. So they're working with their local legislators on enabling CCE in Michigan, um, Massachusetts, Boston, and Cincinnati, Ohio are now forming their own uh, community choice energy authorities. So uh, this option, um, which has been quite successful in California, they got a rough start, but their model now has matured and has become quite successful. If we had a PUC uh, docket on community choice energy, of course, uh, we would have not only our incumbent utilities weighing in on that open docket, and on the 21 questions that my bill asked them to investigate, but then we would have uh, CC, CCA, CCEs, same thing around the country coming to Colorado or over Zoom, uh, weighing in on best practices, lessons learned, uh, and so on. And so uh, this is why I want to study because I think it's it gives us a very full picture. Everyone who has a stake in um, the discussion can come to the table and be heard at the PUC, which is exactly where it needs to be. So we, here we've got reasons why we wanna 
consider CCE. Like for Colorado and Pueblo who attempted uh, to form their own municipal utilities and it just became, you know, for Pueblo, they had a ballot initiative and they were heavily financially outgunned by Black Hills Energy and Boulder just spent, you know, millions of dollars in court with XL Energy. So even though it's a great model for communities, uh, the time and the financial cost has made it extremely difficult. So uh, Community Choice Energy, um, as I mentioned earlier, is considered Muni Light. Um, and the reasons why a uh, community like Boulder would wanna pursue this is it gives us choice. It gives us local control. It's, uh, it's, it would be a nonprofit. Uh, it helps us transition to cleaner energy. Uh, the re revenues we receive, just like a muni would be invested, reinvested in our community, not distributed to shareholders. Um, and of course, wholesale competition reduces rates for everyone, including IOU customers. So, um, and then there are energy resource programs um, that would be more rapidly enabled if we had more control over our uh, power supply. Um, and, and of course, the, the opportunity to develop new uh, renewable energy projects. So just to reiterate, uh, the bill would um, open a docket at the PUC um, to look into how community choice energy, uh, that model would work for Colorado communities. And um, I think I've touched on every point on this slide already. So I think we can move on to the next slide. Yep, and so we've got 21 questions that we are um, asking the PUC to look into. Uh, some are very technical and some are, are broader, um, but really at the end of the day, uh, what we wanna know is, will, would this work in Colorado for Colorado communities and how would it work? And so that's, the bill is easily accessible. I've got the draft. We're, we'll be introducing it probably in the next week to 10 days. Um, so, and this is what the bill is requesting. So if the bill passed uh, this year and the governor signed it, which he said he would, cause he is a supporter. He's, he's uh, strong on, um, the market place uh, the market as a force for change. And this is, I, I would imagine almost everybody on this call uh, are supporters of carbon fee and dividend, dividend and that's a market-based approach. And so is CCE. So we have a regulatory approach that's House Bill 1261, um, and it's you know going moving into its third year of rulemaking, and that's often what happens with the rulemaking process when you use a regulatory approach, is that it can take many years to get those regulations agreed on before they're actually even in force. And uh, a market-based approach obviously depends on the market to to make movement on any particular issue, and in this case, on um, decarbonization of our grid. And uh, Excel and the city of Boulder uh, this year and the Boulder uh, voters uh, approved a 10-year uh, a renewal of their, um, of their franchise agreement after 10 years of being without one. And uh, one of the things that Excel had requested is that Boulder support of community choice energy be taken off the table. And uh, Boulder said, no, they did not want to do that. They'd rather use the leverage of CCE to encourage Excel to meet their stated goals 
decarbonization goals uh, in 1261 than to take that off the table because leverage matters. And this bill is a leverage bill, if it's anything. And um, so let's move along here. In Boulder's franchise agreement, there are off ramps, right? So Boulder has an opportunity to um, move out of the franchise agreement if they do not believe that um, Excel is meeting or exceeding uh, the franchise agreement, the goals of the franchise agreement. And uh, my timeline for Community Choice Energy corresponds pretty nicely with their the first off-ramp. And that is if the governor signs the bill in 2021, then a docket is opened at the PUC. And, uh, and then that brings us into and if we get a favorable uh, um, report from the PUC, if the legislature receives a favorable report from the PUC, uh, then, and if I'm still in office, then I would most likely introduce enabling legislation in 2023. And if that is successful and is signed by the governor, then the rulemaking process begins. And that rulemaking process, you know, could take well over a year, which means that um, the first year, realistically, for a community to even begin a consideration of forming their own CCE authority would be 2025. And of course, you know, this is a very public transparent process locally. It's a city council. Um, is the one who would propose it and they would engage the community and that's a conversation and you know Boulder is um, uh, not shy about robust conversation about any issue and uh, so but that would be the first year so 2025 would be the first year uh, if everything went according to plan you know for CCE legislation that would be the first year that um, a community like Boulder or Denver or Pueblo could even consider uh, adoption of a CCE authority. And um, so I, I think that timeline works really well. And um, if Excel, at least for us or Black Hills, they've got their own resource plan. Uh, I don't, I'm not quite sure exactly when they're submitting that to the PUC. I do not believe it's this year. But anyway, um, it gives them time to meet or exceed the goals, the public goals that they have stated. And if that's the case, then communities who have the choice may not even exercise it because their incumbent utility is already um, achieving their re renewable energy aspirations that they have. So um, I think now, because I, I know we've got a lot of people on the call and, uh, and I'm, I know there's gotta be plenty of questions. So I'll just take a break here and um, create an opportunity for you to ask questions. And I'm really happy to answer them. And as Leslie pointed out, Larry Milosevic is, uh, Milosevic is on the phone call and he really is uh, uh, an authority on the issue. And so whatever I can answer, I will invite him to jump in. Very good, uh, Representative Hood, that was wonderful. And we're so excited. And uh, you know, this is, as you say, it's leverage, you know, you just keep so asking for what you want and uh, we keep seeing our utilities move in the right direction and we're so grateful to them because we understand that it's not easy to make this massive transition in how we produce our electricity. We also know it's foundational to addressing climate change. Um, one of the first questions, Representative Hooten, is how would this impact rural communities serviced by REAs who buy energy from Tri-State? and Larry, if you want to turn your video on to, you know, maybe the two of you will make great tag team here. Well, I'll just say, and I'm going to let Larry fill you with the details, but um, there are co-ops served by REAs 
um, that have either separated or have um, put a lot of pressure on their REAs to onboard more renewables. And that's, you know, that's one of the beauties of, of, of the co-ops is that they have that capacity to do that. They can um, negotiate directly with their power provider on um, you know the source of their energy, but Larry, how about you jump in? Because I know you're really good at this. Um, I, I think one of the benefits to co-ops and munis, they're indirect benefits because of course um, communities in uh, co-op or, or muni territory or, or uh, don't have the ability to form their own CCE. So the, the benefits would be indirect. And I think I think the main one is just that. Um, CCE would help to stimulate a more vibrant wholesale market in the state. And the wholesale market is, is where yeah. uh, co-ops and munis uh, get their, their electricity. And so having a more vibrant uh, wholesale market, more vibrant competition, wholesale competition, um, would, would likely uh, help to bring prices down on the wholesale market. And uh, co-ops and munis would benefit from that as well. Yes, and I, I think uh, the, the folks at, and it is exciting because we have people from all over the state tonight, Representative Hooten, um, <clears throat> and it is exciting because there's sort of a parallel battle going on in tri-state territory as rural co-ops try to buy, you know, get the exit fee and pay the exit fee and leave tri-state so they can move faster and get lower rates, and that's a whole nother set of challenges for sure. But it's all part of this big transition in my mind that we're part of, which is this question about what happens when you can bring competition in and do you get a better product at a lower price? And the mechanisms are a little different whether you're in a rural electric association or whether you're here. But I think as Larry said, I'm just gonna call him Larry because we're friends <laughs> instead of Mr. Milosevic. Uh, <laughs> what Larry said is that, you know, it's, it's a synergistic kind of process where ideas in one realm, whether in the IOU realm can accelerate ideas in the rural electric realm. And ideas in the rural electric realm have definitely accelerated thinking in the IOU territory. As we watch places like Delta Montrose, um, Kit Carson down in house, now we have several other rural electrics that are trying to buy out. And they can buy out from Tri-State, get a better product, have more of it generated locally, and lower their rates even with their buyout fee. So that sort of that sort of movement, a couple of weeks ago, we heard from Holy Cross Energy, which is not under Tri-State, but they were able to kind of work a deal with Guzman and some other things. They're determined they're gonna be at 100% renewable electricity by 2030 and lower their rates between now and then, or use the dividend to help their customers. So to me, it's what Larry said, which is that it all kind of feeds off of each other there's some questions about uh, Representative Hooten and Larry. There's some questions and you've mentioned it, but I wondered if one or both of you could really drill down on to make sure that the listeners are clear on the difference between the choice that happened in Texas, which didn't turn out so well, and the kind of choice that you're proposing in your study bill. Um, and either or both of you wanna weigh in on that, that would be helpful. Well, I'll start, I'll kick it off and then I'll let Larry fill in the gaps. Um, so community choice energy is a wholesale model. So it's communities procuring uh, energy and, um, and, and then providing that for their, um, for their rate payers for the members of their community. Texas, Pennsylvania, those are retail states. So the incumbent, so the utilities have to completely divest from energy generation or uh, supply. All they do is transmission and distribution. And uh, what happens at in a retail state is you've got many retailers who are selling packages, um, electric, you know, energy packages to individual consumers. It creates a lot of churn in the market. It is not conducive to long-term investments in 
large scale renewable energy projects, which is exactly what we want to do. And um, so the, the two can't be conflated. And this is, uh, you know, one of the, the problems with retail is that there's just very little incentive for the utilities to invest in their infrastructure. Uh, and that's what happened in Texas. They did not invest in upgrading their infrastructure. And, you know, the excuse is we've never had cold weather um, or weather this extreme. Okay, I don't know how much I want to buy that, but I can say we've been dealing with the impacts of climate change uh, pretty dramatically in the past 20 years. And to say that this is never going to happen to me is kind of irresponsible, but that's what happened to them. And we'll see, you know, how Texas addresses that. But, you know, those huge utility rates, thousands of dollars that some customers are paying are a direct result of the retail model of um, consumer choice. And so we're not looking at that at all. We're looking, this is a wholesale model. And Larry, I'm giving, turn it over to you. Fill, fill in the gaps. Um, That's dude. great. There's, there's a, a lot there. Uh, Texas is not only different from Colorado, Texas is different from basically everywhere else, including the other deregulated states. Um, one thing that, that is particularly notable about Texas is uh, resource planning and the, the regulatory environment. Of course, Texas is deregulated, Colorado is a re regulated. And so we have this, this formal pretty elaborate but also very effective resource planning process so we don't we don't run our electricity system like close with a low um uh, what what's the term reserve. A low reserve reserve margin yeah um texas lets the market determine when they need new generation based on the price the price when um when there's scarcity the price goes up this is what happened there when people got these huge bills, the um, scarcity pricing, their bills went up enormously, $9,000 a megawatt hour is their cap, which anybody that knows prices knows that that's like uh, almost infinite. That's a huge amount of money um, mm -hmm. per megawatt hour. And the idea is just that those high prices will tell the market that we need more generation. So, um, um, generators will go out there and they'll build more generation because there's they see there's a demand for it. But it just doesn't seem like the, the time scales don't mesh. Um, now we see that there's a great need for generation under some circumstances in Texas, but it would take years to build more generation and there's still not the financial incentive because it's so rare that an event like that comes along where something like that just would not happen in Colorado because, uh, because of our um, resource planning um environment here very good and i really want to just underscore this representative Putin. you said it about four times but i'm going to say it one more time because it's so important and hopefully that everybody on the call can help carry this message in texas they have retail choice where individuals are making decisions and your bill is pro proposing community choice where a community makes the decisions and we keep a significant part probably of our regulatory system intact. And that's why you wanna have the study so we can figure out which parts of the old system do we keep and which parts do we put in with new. But the key is you don't have individuals trying to figure this out. Uh, you have communities working as a block and we're gonna to get to the California piece. We have some questions there, but um, I see you nodding your head. So I just wanna- oh, Exactly yeah. right, Leslie. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. And and grateful to everybody on the call if you can help carry that message because you know this is getting a little wonky down here, down in the weeds. So we appreciate you spending time with us on this deep dive tonight. Um, the next question that I thought I'd ask comes from Bob Doyle. Doyle, and and Bob's question is: Would this bill and the implementation of CCE promote distributed energy, distributed energy generation by energy users? And if so, how? So Larry, Larry, you might need to help me with this, but 
uh, yeah, and this is probably why I was such a strong proponent of municipalization because you have so many more options, especially around distributed energy. Um, I think we there are some limitations and uh, this is why we would call it um, Muni light and not full Muni, but I, I'm gonna let Larry, uh, I hate to defer to the resident expert, but <laughs> I have to. Uh, Larry, if you wanna take that, that'd be great. Um, sure. Uh two things. I guess the, the first is just that that's a very good question. And the way I know it's a very good question is because it's one of the questions, one of the 21 questions in the docket specifically <laughs> asks whether, uh, let's see if I can remember the wording approximately right, whether um, what would, would community choice hinder or facilitate um, um, distributed energy resources and beneficial electrification, throwing both of those both of those in, the distributed energy resources as well as electrification. Uh, what would CCE mean for that? That's one of the questions in the docket. So everyone that, I don't know how much everyone on the call knows about how PUC invest, investigatory dockets work, but basically any interested party, stakeholders, uh, uh, which represent all sorts of groups, environmental groups, consumer advocates, utilities, of course, um, and even individuals, uh, myself, Leslie, weigh in at the PUC, um, submit comments into the formal process. And then they also have commissioner information meetings, like workshops, basically, with invited expert speakers to come and speak on these topics. And that's what will happen in this docket is people will weigh in on that very question. Um, you know, uh, uh, COSA, uh, Colorado uh, Solar and Storage Association, for example, I'm sure they have a lot to say about what would CCE mean for distributed energy resources. And so they would weigh in on the docket. Mm -hmm. Utilities would weigh in, everyone would weigh in. So, we, so part one of the answer to the question is, we'll get an answer to that question because it's going to be part of the docket. Part two, is that one of the great things that CCE does besides allowing you to have some control over your energy sources by going out and getting your own wholesale energy uh, power supply is you have local choices too for um, energy programs, whatever, you know, whatever is important to a given community, they have a lot more to control to institute energy programs. Uh, low income programs might be one. Distributed energy resource programs promoting distributed energy resources, uh, I would think would be another popular type of local program that uh, communities can do under uh, uh, CCE. Excellent. Thank, thank you so much. And the one way I look at some people who know me know I have spent, uh, I don't know, 15, 17 years, something like that at the Utilities Commission. And, um, yeah, I'm trained as a scientist. There are physical laws that we can't defy, the first and second law of thermodynamics, but everything else is just a social construct. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, what Representative Hooten is doing and all of these questions is helping us think about all of our options moving forward. And I think as we see, one of the things I say, what it, we see, because I think your question around distributed generation is so important. Um, we spend a lot of time in the 20th century building what is often sometimes referred to as the big grid three big grids in the United States, the Eastern grid, the Western grid, and the Texas grid. And we just saw what happened to the Texas grid. Um, they were a magnificent, amazing engineering constructions. But in, in a century of extreme weather, what we did in the 20th century might not be best for the 21st century. And so this whole question about, do we rely on generation that's a long ways away at the end of a transmission line? Or do we build our resources closer to home, make microgrids? We know that in the California fires, it was the microgrid on the Native American lands that was the only place that had lights and you could charge your phone and you could bring your patients that were on oxygen and everything else there and on other medical equipment. And the same kind of lesson from Texas. So the question is excellent. We can't say that we know the answer, but as Larry says, the important thing is to continue to ask that question and to weigh the best path forward for the 21st century. Um, I want to, the next question that I think we'll take uh, is from Martin Volker from Golden. Some of you know, has done a magnificent job with uh, Jefferson County Renewable Energy Society. 
Martin asks, are there lessons from California? I'm asking because it's unlikely that everything went well there. So I think Larry's first answer will be, well, that's why we're doing the study. But uh, what do we know right now about what they've learned in California? How that, How is that working out? We know about, we've heard a little bit about marine clean energy. Are they able to have lower rates? Is it working out? Do they have cleaner energy? How are things working there? So I'll just say um, they're working extremely well, um, but it, they had um, some really difficult early years. Uh, I don't, I think 50, 50, 55 communities, Larry, uh, now are served by um, CC, well, in California, they refer to them as CCAs. Um, and they are achieving 100% renewable energy. They are far exceeding California's uh, renewable energy uh, resource plans. Uh, they had a rough go of it early on because they didn't get the exit fees figured out. So their communities were paying higher utility rates because of the way their uh, exit fees were structured and so that is something that uh, our study bill is doing, is uh, asking the PUC to figure out the formula and the timeline for exit fees. And uh, if we get to a PUC docket, uh, you could be rest assured that um, executive directors of CCE authorities from California will come in and share um, lessons learned uh, from the early days of establishing CCEs in California and how they would advise us uh, to avoid the pitfalls and take advantage of what has succeeded for them. So what would you add to that, Larry? Um, that's, that's pretty good. It is. It at least the last part does come back, as Leslie pointed out, to what I'm likely to say, which is that's what the study is about, is to learn these lessons from other states. And that's exactly what we'll do, which, which you had just mentioned too, Representative Hooten, that no doubt people from California would, would be coming to participate and testify in this docket about what are the lessons learned from California. Yeah, the exit fee one is a good one. The analogy that applies so well to California is this idea of building the plane while it's in flight. That's how they implemented CCA there is they implemented it and let it go. And then they have to keep coming back over and over to try to fix problems. A big problem is with the exit fee. And one, one of the lessons that I'm sure that we'll learn from that is that, um, well, I already know from talking with California people, is to have a limited time frame, an expiration date on the exit fee, so that it's not open ended, so that C the CCE, the organization of CCEs in the state, doesn't have to battle with the IOUs all the time at the PUC into how to update the calculation of that exit fee. What we want to do is number one, we want to have a formula. What should be considered when you calculate the exit fee? That's one of the big things that the docket will is aimed at pinning down so that the answers to that question can be written into enabling legislation. And so that some duration, some expiration date for the exit fee can be written into the enabling legislation um, so that it's not so open-ended. Uh, and contentious as it is in California, it's figured out ahead of time. As and as far as um, what has CCE done in California for renewables, just um, well, Representative Hooten member there, mentioned there are over 50 communities that have already met their 100% renewable energy goals in California, and the vast majority of them are, are CCA communities. And another. Uh, Another fact, I guess, to throw in is that the uh, CCAs in California have already procured cumulatively over six gigawatts, 6,000 megawatts of um, new build renewable energy long-term contracts. And that's a big lesson from California 
too, that they got right. And that is to require a certain percentage. I don't know the numbers. I'm thinking it's something like 60% of CCA contracts have to be 10 years or longer, something, but don't quote me on that. Um, and that's very important because that provides the, the long time scale that's needed to give financers confidence that the uh, customer base is gonna be stable enough to merit investment in new renewable energy. And you don't get that in the retail choice states where there are six month, one year, two year contracts and a lot of you know, customer churn. That's not the kind of environment that's conducive to the long-term uh, investment that's needed for new build renewable energies. But, so, but California got that right and we would want to aim to do that too. Yeah, thank you so much to both of you. And, you know, will be fun. And yeah, this is a, one of those softball questions. Uh, if the PUC were to study this and say, there's no way we can make this work in Colorado and it's likely to lead to a Texas situation or some terrible thing like that, then uh, I think it might be a fair assumption that Representative Hooten wouldn't run enabling level legislation. Is that is that true? If, uh, if, if we find out that it's just a terrible, terrible idea after we've studied it, you know, that's well, why I, we're studying it, right? <laughs> I think, um, fortunately, we know the PUC commissioners well enough uh, to know that they do understand the difference between the wholesale model and the retail model. So um, I don't think that would be a problem. Uh, I can't imagine um, that they would say this was a terrible idea they may raise some flags uh, about how this may be more difficult uh, in Colorado because right now we don't belong to a regional transmission or organization. Um, but you know we've got 29 munis in the state of Colorado and they don't belong to a regional transmission organization and they function just fine. But you know, I think, uh, a PUC study, I think our questions are incredibly well thought out. We've been working on them for over two years. And um, what they would do is some of what we're looking for would be green lighted and others would be flagged for us. If we ran enabling legislation, we would address those flags. Um, I don't see how it would be possible for the PUC to confuse retail with wholesale. Um, we've got nine states in the United States that are already um, uh, exercising uh, community choice wholesale models. And then we've got the retail states and, uh, you know, through the the open docket uh, proceedings, it would be very easy to course correct if it seems to be going sideways there. If that's your question. Um, anyway, well, that, that's sure that's that there Thank you. on the straight and narrow around exactly what we're, we're hoping that they uh, will um, um, investigate. Yeah, very good, thank you. If I could just add, um, yeah, if, if hypothetically the PUC came back and said this would be a really bad idea, it wouldn't work well for Colorado for this and this and this reason, and they were solid reasons, well, I presume that we probably wouldn't pursue it if we, if, if we bought that. Um, but I just uh, don't see it happening. I do see them coming back with uh, a report that contains uh, a section, maybe it would be called challenges. And frankly, that's probably about the best thing we could hope for is to identify what, what are the challenges so that we can uh, mitigate them as best possible when writing enabling legislation. That's right. And I just, uh, I saw a question just pop up that I wanna answer and it was, will the uh, exiting munis or I think they probably meant to say existing muni suffer through community yes. choice energy. So um, yes. community choice energy authorities only um, exist in 
IOU territory. If you're a muni or if you're a co-op, um, you wouldn't even consider community choice energy model. Um, that, I mean, first of all, that would be made clear in any enabling legislation, but munis and co-ops um, and community choice energy models, there's, it's a little bit apples and oranges because community choice energy authorities would only exist in communities served by um, an investor owned utility not served by um, a muni or uh, an a REA or a co-op. Thank, thank you, Representative Hooten, for taking that, that question. And I think I want to make a comment. Uh, Patrick Murphy from Boulder has been making a lot of comments in the, in the chat, which is not really the purpose of the chat. Uh, but um, one of one of Patrick's questions was, well, the only big buyers can get good rates. And Larry's kind of responded to that. I'm going to let him, Larry, Larry and Representative Hooten come back to it. But that's part of what, what Chris Hoffman was talking about when we saw the Boulder RFIP. That was the response when people said, oh, well, only XL can get good rates on their wind and solar. So the city of Boulder went out on what was called the request for indicative pricing. Chris Hoffman went through those results. Um, and we had suppliers. There was a whole list of them at the bottom of that PowerPoint slide that were ready to bring us much higher levels of renewable electricity with the, you know, the best looking bid being 89% renewable electricity by 2024 and save about 40 million a year or get to 100% by 2030 and save 30 million. So that, I think that doesn't work. And Larry, I think that's another way to ask this question, Larry, is when communities in, and, and Representative Hooten, but I know Larry's the guy who's immersed in this, uh, when communities in California have looked at, for example, Marin Clean Energy, went, which went first, have we seen the number of communities in California grow over the last decade? Or have we seen them like look at Marin and go, oh, we would never want to go down that road? <laughs> Au contraire. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually go grown ahead, Larry. Quite, it's grown quite dramatically, isn't yeah, that it's, correct? It really, yeah. it's exploded it, and it, it's continuing to explode. That is, it's, it's more exponential than linear. Um, uh, it, it's just really taking off. And in fact, I remember the, uh, let's see, I think it's the uh, California PUC, I believe it, it is, that uh, did a study and they're predicting that by 2025, 85% of the load in California will be served by uh, non-IOUs. Uh, and and the, mostly that means CCAs, but they also have this other thing in California that we don't have called direct access, which is large companies that can contract on their own. So a combination of direct access and CCAs <laughs> will serve 85% of the load in California by 2025. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not there now, that's where it's, it's heading though. And so yeah, it, uh, CCA has been really um, exploding in California. And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about, about this idea of, of prices and Boulder's RFIP, Getting good prices, it's, that's where the word aggregation comes from. Um, Representative Hooten made the choice early on in this to go with community choice energy rather than community choice aggregation, just because community choice energy makes intuitive sense. And aggregation, what is that really? You know, it's, it's kind of confusing uh, just what is meant by that. But what's meant by that is you're aggregating the load of many people. In, in a community, at least one community or many communities. And that allows you to have purchasing power. And that's why Boulder can get a good price because it's to serve all of the load in Boulder, which is substantial. And uh, the thing I wanted to add to that is this idea uh, of a joint powers authority, it's called uh, in California, where it's not just individual communities that uh, for, would form a CCE, multiple communities, multiple cities and counties and groups of cities and counties can all get together and form large, um, large CCEs, which have much greater purchasing power. And the important thing I think about that is that it allows small communities to participate in CCE too. So this isn't just for Denver, Boulder and Pueblo that have all this 
purchasing power because they have a large population. Um, but many counties with many small communities can all band together and form a joint, uh, joint powers authority, JPA, and pool all of their load. And then everybody, including those small communities, can get um, this price advantage and also share the administration of the CCE. So small communities aren't overwhelmed by the idea of, can we actually administer this ourselves? We're just a little tiny community. Well, banded together with many others, they can share that administration uh, as well as, as share the price advantages of coming together. Excellent, Larry, thank you so much. Um, I wanna make one other follow-up comment. Uh, there was the, the mention about the RFIPO. It's just, uh, you know, kind of, uh, imaginary bids or something. Well, we have really great examples already in Colorado. We have Holy Cross Energy, which serves the air around Aspen and Vail, working with an independent supplier, Guzman. It's lowered their power rates substantially. We had, we started at 530. I think we were still going at nine o'clock a few weeks ago with Holy Cross, as we talked about all the things they're doing. And what they do with what they call that renewable dividend is to help their customers save energy, to let them have access to Tesla power walls at a cheap price. They're working on all the interfaces so we can start charging smartly when we plug in our cars instead of charging dumbly. Uh, they've built affordable housing for their, help build affordable housing for their teachers and their nurses. Um, Delta Montrose went through the same exercise and when they were able to pull away from Tri-State, they were able to get a bunch. And these are not, although they're relatively big for REAs, I think Holy Cross's load is under 300 megawatts. So it's it's we're seeing it all over, and this is this synergy of ideas between the rural co-ops and the IOU territory in Colorado. Uh, but Representative Uden, uh, Jan Rose, who I think you know, has asked if you could uh, give us a feel for what the opposition is looking like. And uh, I remind you that we at least had several uh, lobbyists lined up. So you you answer that question however you want. I'm not sure how many are on the call, but uh, Jan is just kind of wondering where the politics are on this. Yeah. So I would say, I mean, naturally, um, the IOUs are opposed. Um, and we can understand why. Uh, so I don't have to explain that. Um, so they're opposed. I think, um, I guess my biggest challenge is we've got some environmental partners who are not in a support position. They're in a neutral position. And that is a great source of frustration to me because they, uh, through their promotional materials uh, to their members and to attract new members, they talk about you know all that they're doing at the Capitol um, to advance uh, you know, aggressive renewable energy goals, but at the end of the day, they are, they don't want to rock the boat. They would rather um, maintain a comfortable relationship with the utilities who have had a presence at the Capitol for over a hundred years. And, uh, and they would just rather take the regulatory approach. I would just call it the slow boat to China and um, and they're not supporting my bill. And, uh, and that sends a message to a lot of my colleagues who um, are deep into energy issues and they just rely on um, um, these environmental partners, these organizations, they rely on them to signal where they are on a bill. And um, it can be very difficult. It is very difficult for me when you've got uh, the industry lobbyists who are great people and they've got great relationships uh, with members on both sides of the aisle. And of course they're lobbying them with their position and that's their job, that's what they do. And then we've got um, some pretty significant environmental partners who are neutral on the bill, which is a signal to my colleagues that they're not supportive. Because if they were supportive, they'd be testifying, right? And they'd be promoting. So that's a challenge for me. 
And it really, it, it boils down to very long-standing relationships with organizations where you just rather um, get along and go along than really put yourself out there for significant change. And I am telling you, I don't have to tell anyone on this call, the, the dire um, emergency that we are facing and everything that we can do within our power to decarbonize our electric supply, we absolutely should. So I'm supportive of building electrification. Yeah, that's great. And I'm supporting, uh, supportive of uh, electrifying our transportation sector. Absolutely, 100%. But if we're not changing um, the, the mix of our electric supply on the grid, then to what end? To what end? If we are just increasing the use of electricity without decarbonizing the supply, I would really, I ask, I beg the question, what kind of advancement are we making here? Yeah, hey, thank you so much. This is kind of difficult to do. Um, I'm available. I know some of what Representative Hooten's talking about. So I think we'll not go too much farther down this road in this big public forum here, but yeah. um, I, I'm available to do some of, some of that afterwards. Um, and uh, I, I would like to get about 10 after seven or so, Representative Hooten, we know your days are wickedly, wickedly long. Uh, I think I would like to comment. On the one hand, we understand that the IOUs are opposed but one of the ways I was thinking about it today when I was out on a long kind of walk was just like, what if you were a high school sports team and you were the only team in your league and every year you won? Like, ultimately, that's not actually very good. You, competition is what brings out the best. And it would be boring as all get out to be the only football team or the only basketball team in your league and you just never had to play a game and you never had to get your skills better and and so on the one hand I understand that their first instinct is to avoid competition but um, I don't know you know I come out of a business family actually and 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 my dad really relished the competition because he knew it's what brought out the best um our son is in a, a startup type thing and it's the competition that makes you better so yeah, the first instinct is, oh, we've been a monopoly for a hundred years, so don't let us have to deal with competition. But I think that's not quite right thinking. We all have to live on this planet together. And I think competition, even the threat of competition has done a lot to help both XL and Black Hills move in, a, in the right direction. So um, with that, I think what we often do on these calls is we let Representative Hooten go because when I go down to the Capitol, I just, go crazy thinking about what it's like to be down there every day. I mean, every time they turn around, somebody else wants to talk to them about some completely different subject. And it goes on hour after hour after hour, day after day for four or five intense months. So I'd like to let Representative Hu, you're certainly welcome to stay, but I'd like to let you go. Uh, then those of us that are, you know, into chatting about these things will hang out. Um, and uh, you're very welcome to stay, of course, but, um, I do know that you probably haven't even had dinner or anything else. So, uh, oh, I've, I've eaten a, a whole bag of pretzels. <laughs> <laughs> the legislators' diet, right? <laughs> so. Oh my god! Right, I'm trying to avoid, um, you know, uh, breakfast burritos. Really, that that's the uh, that's the that's the really the, yeah that that'll compromise all of your fitness. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you do a magnificent job, but. Well, thank you. So anyway, lastly, I just want to say thank you for having me and thank you for everyone on this call and for your interest in CCE and for all the comments. I'm sorry I wasn't able to watch them um, as closely as I would have liked to. And of course, just huge gratitude to Larry uh, working with him. And oh my gosh, it's, it, this is, it's, it's exciting to work on and um, the possibilities are great. And I appreciate all of your support. And with that, I will say adieu and have a great night. 
And um, I look forward to hearing about the rest of your conversation. Thank you. Representative Putin? Yeah. One moment um, before you leave. Um, perhaps there are people that would like to hear an answer to the question, which I can give, but I just want to be sure you're here in case you want to give first. Okay. And that is uh, how they can help. Oh, yes. Thank you, Larry. Duh. <laughs> um, you, you know what really makes a difference <laughs> is reaching out to uh, your legislator. And if, if you are, if I don't know, I, how many of you are just from Boulder or statewide, but statewide. legislators respond to their constituents. And if you could reach out to them and give them a little bit of information, tell them why you think this is important um, to support. It's just a study bill after <laughs> all. It changes nothing, nothing. <laughs> and um, the first year could actually even be implemented would be 2025 so there's the big lead time larry um, um he is really great at um drafting language if you need help uh just like drafting a letter to your local representative your state representative your state senator i think that makes a bigger difference than anything else so you reaching out to somebody who actually represents you and you make the case uh, for supporting the bill. And Larry, you probably have other ideas because he and I talk about this so much, but I want to give you time to talk amongst yourselves. And um, so I'll let you take this over, Larry. Thank you, Leslie, once again, and everyone else on this call. Thanks, Representative Hooten. Right. It's not easy being out in front. You're doing a magnificent job. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> All right. Amen. Thanks to your family. Yeah, same to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The, the comments, I don't know if we have Representative Hooten's staff on uh, Cooper, but um, if we do, Cooper, if you're on, uh, you know, there were just a ton of, of comments in the chat thanking, uh, uh, yeah, Cooper's on. Cooper is uh, Representative Hooten's amazing aide who juggles as much as as much as the Cooper, if you want to turn your uh, your uh, video on, yeah. we'd love to see you. What, uh, what's that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on the couch here. Sorry, but hi, hi everyone. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> uh, thank you, Cooper. As much as yeah, Representative please. Newton juggles, Cooper has to juggle everything in the background for her. So, uh, <laughs> Cooper, we're super grateful to you. And uh, I don't know if you saw there are lots of comments in the in the chat thanking Representative Newton. Yeah. I, I I didn't get a chance to underscore that for her. So. I'll save them all for her, and uh, I actually have to go eat dinner myself. But thank you we all understand. for uh, thank you all for attending. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Cooper. Thanks for making this uh, work out. We appreciate yeah. that so much. Of course. Cheers. Cheers. Um, and I don't know if Richard Valenti is on, who was is also on. There's Richard. Richard, if you want to uh, take your video off and say a quick hello, Richard is another part of the the uh, team for Representative Hooten. And uh, a long time capital uh, brain. I'm sure there's a better word for that. Uh, <laughs> and he worked with uh, Senator Heath for a long time. Richard, if you just want to say hi, and then you probably maybe want to go too, because we know your days are long, but you're welcome to stay, of course, but just wanted to give you a chance to say hi. Well, hi to everybody, and thanks for doing this. It's a great venue to uh, get some ideas out there. I'm staying off video due to um, spaghetti and stuff like that. Um, so I just wanted to say hi really quickly and um, thanks to everybody. Yeah, thanks for working with Representative Hooten. We're so pleased and grateful to her for leading the way and helping Colorado move forward like this. So uh, it takes great staff to get this work done. So thank you. My pleasure, believe me. <laughs> yes, I bet it's your pleasure. She, she's, she's amazing.